The Football Show on Off The Ball. I'm prepared to do anything I can well, to do play it my then. country again. Do it then. What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> Why should be an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? Oh. Welcome along to the football show here on Off The Ball. A one-all draw secured with a late Irish equaliser after some pressure. Before that, Ireland having a little bit of a backs-to-the-wall performance, a good showing from a goalkeeper and some last gas defending. David Sned, that doesn't necessarily mean Serbia against the Republic of Ireland last night. That could have been any number of Irish performances over the last 10 years. I was going to say, yeah, it's like the good old days, what? Well. <laughs> Gen- genuinely, um, though, like this, when Ireland get results like this against superior opposition, and Serbia are superior opposition, they might not have got to the Euros last year, but they have improved quite a bit since and have been really good oh, in the yeah. group so far. Ireland up against it for large stages of last night's game, but they dug in for long enough with Gavin Bazunu pulling off a few heroics, and that meant that the stand of the last 10 minutes were possible. That's very much like games against Germany that I can remember where Ireland were pinching results. Many of the best performances that Ireland have put in have been about being disciplined and then getting that equaliser. Nothing too different about last night. Well, literally, nine on the head. And it, even talking about Serbia, like, I was in, I was in Portugal, Faro, for, for the Portugal game last week. Serbia were a lot more impressive as a team and how, and how they operated and how they moved the ball and even obviously defence into midfield but then just obviously the attack too um, like, and obviously they didn't get the win but as a team in terms of just it's international football it's all about getting that, that structure right and players buying into a system and just wholeheartedly actually it working and that's what Serbia have done like you know what I mean like they are it's a I think it was something that like Stephen Kenny kind of like touched upon how much they've actually improved, and it's something that Ireland could, should be should be looking at in terms of how 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 they're going to, how things will be moving forward. Hopefully, the pa- the plan that Kenny will be put in place. I don't, I don't think you have to look too much further than what Serbia have done in terms of the work that, and the infrastructure that they've put in over the last decade, and it is beginning to bear fruit. They've had a success at at underage level and listen it's all it is all it tends to be one of them where you know you, you come against a country and they look to do well and they're like oh we have to just copy what they do but they've actually done something that works for them and i think further down the line that's what that is what's going to happen you would you would imagine and what has to happen now with with irish football but listen it's it's like the story of this whole campaign and since Stephen kenny has taken over it's, it's almost as if you can't have a discussion about the senior team and what the senior team are doing without what's happening on the overall grand scheme of things. But it is finally a topic and a discussion that that is happening hand in hand and not just at the end of a, of a disappointing campaign. I do think people now are beginning to realise that there needs to be a bit more cohesive joined up thinking. And if, if you look at the difference, if you look at the difference between the, two, between the two teams, not just in the players, but in terms of how teams are moulded and come together, it was quite evident of of like the differences between between the two nations and and why one is will have maybe a bit more prolonged success and why in the other like, like in Ireland will have to build for a bit longer. Can I suggest one of the main reasons that Serbia are that bit further ahead is having a player like Dusan Tadic who was able to vary up their attack. One thing that's really been missing, I think, uh, for Ireland for quite some time, maybe even since Wes Hulahan retired is a type of player who can get his foot in the ball, get into those pockets of spaces around the number 10 position. Maybe in time, that's going to be Troy Parrott. But Ireland haven't had that type of player for a while. So we're so reliant on getting the ball out wide, whipping in crosses, as opposed to maybe having a little bit more variety in the final third. Yeah, no, listen, absolutely. Like You look, you look at Dusan Tadic and, and just that role he plays in, in the team and he he's everywhere. And I, 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 he's had a bit of a resurgence in his career, obviously, since leaving the Premier League and going to and going to Ajax and being able to flourish a bit more because it was a strange. And I don't think people would have seen him in the Premier League, and I don't think they would have had him pegged as quite that gifted a, a, of a player and who can be that, who can be that influential. And yeah, like at the moment, like that is an issue. Obviously, not having it, it was clear to all to see the lack of creativity that's been there that has been there for a while. But then you do have to find other ways, other ways around that. And I think there were times when Ireland did look dangerous. There were also times when they were they were cut open. And some of the the general passing and the the lingo play from from Serbia was uh, was exceptional, really. And like it was hard 
it was hard not to look at them and, and, and being in awe is a, is, is a bit much, but it was just, it was actually very enjoyable. It was very enjoyable to watch, partly because Ireland had Gavin Bazuna who was stopping them from scoring goals. Yeah, let's let's focus a bit on Gavin Bazunu here because I know you went out to meet his mum and had a chat with his family last year, which you can probably talk about in a bit more detail in a moment. But last night he showed a great variety of skills for such a young goalkeeper at 19 years of age. We remember him coming through with Shamrock Rovers at 16, saving penalties in the League of Ireland at such a young age. But now, even just three years further on to his development, excellent with blocking the ball with his feet, made good saves down on either side. His distribution for the best part over these three games and over his seven starts so far has been excellent, with the exception of one pass he left short in Faro against Portugal. He is showing a tremendous amount of promise as a Republic of Ireland number one, despite just being a teenager. Absolutely, and if, if you look at the start of this campaign, go back to the, the first game against Serbia, if it wasn't for an injury for, for Cuevin Kelleher, he, it would have been Kelleher who maybe would have got the got the nod ahead of uh, ahead of Gavin Bizzuno. Uh, he he showed he showed last night, and it was, I don't know, it, I got the sense in the stadium, there was an early pass again where he played it out, it was only in the, in the first couple of minutes, I think he went to um, Omobamadele, and he, he passed it back in towards Shane Duffy and Duffy miscontrolled it and Vlavic got in for a shot and and uh, Bizuno got out and kind of just smothered the danger and made a good save. And then you're kind of thinking after that there was a bit of nerves on the place. So I'll be loyal, it was one of them was I think people were beginning to get a bit anxious. And listen, it's only natural because it's kind of like we're caught in two worlds at the moment between what Stephen Kenny and the coach and staff and even what the players that are there want to do and what had come before and what people are so used to seeing. And you, do, you, you don't even need this, like, obviously people talk about bravery in sports but it's just bravery you encourage your convictions in terms of carrying out a game plan and as that second half as that first half pardon me went on he was the one who I felt actually was kind of like almost setting the team down he was the one giving the players options he was the one actually like you seen him and he, he was coming out not just in and being in reckless positions but he was giving like defenders and giving his full backs when they were under pressure an angle for an out ball and the amount of times where they they did trust them to actually give the ball back, like you saw one of the stats earlier uh, today, that if you go back to the Luxembourg game, I think the ball was passed back to him maybe ten times, whereas this in this game it was over twice. That was I think it was actually between twenty five and twenty eight times. So like he got a sense then that obviously that Luxembourg result was probably the nadir obviously at this point in the campaign. You get a sense now of the players now trusting, believing in them as well, and knowing that this kid is the real deal, and. Like I picked it out, I was doing I actually ended up doing a piece that was focused on him just because of how the game turned out and for, for the 42. And there was a moment in the first half, and I just thought it was pretty critical because I, could, I, I got the sense after that in the game where people, even in the crowd, just almost it was like a sigh of relief or a sigh of just, oh, okay, you've got someone here as when Ball was played back to him, put his foot on the ball, he was about to get closed down. Rather than just, and I was expecting him to do it, I'll be honest, rather than just maybe playing like out, out for touch or just clearing his lines, he literally put his foot on the ball, rolled it a couple of, yard, couple of yards to the to the right and pinged the ball out to uh, to Matt Doherty. Ireland kept possession. And it was just at that little moment that just relieved a small bit of pressure, brought that little sense of calm. And he did it throughout the game. He made two, two excellent saves, world-class saves, I would say, from, from Alexander Mitrovic in the second half. And that again, being in the stadium, it was felt like a moment that like, you sometimes get from like a midfielder or a striker to do something in the game that lifts the crowd. It was like the, the crowd visibly got behind what was happening in terms of they realised, yeah, Ireland are under a bit of pressure here, but so they've got someone special at the back here who's who's capable of keeping it out. And in those last few minutes, when uh, I think it was was it, um, I can't remember now the, the the left winger, pardon me, his name totally escapes me broke when Conor Howdahan had lost the ball from Ireland's own short corner and he had a great chance to kill the game 2-0 and again he gets out cut, cuts the angle down smothers the ball gets it and releases an attack for Ireland and a couple of minutes later Ireland equalised and I got that sense in, in those last 15 minutes and you, the crowd and the energy that was about the place and even the players and they all spoke about it after it was just it just <laughs> like we were talking about messing with the good old days but it actually there's been very few nights of that India the event. Obviously, talk about beating Jeremy, the world champions, absolutely sensational result, uh, which was just incredible. And then again, the playoffs to get to the Euros when they just overpowered and just actually outclassed Bosnia. But in, in the recent times, it's been very few moments in the Aviva where it's actually felt like a, a football stadium with a bit of heart and soul. It's like felt 
absolutely soulless at times. No more so in the last couple of years when there has been no fans. And you just get the sense, I don't know, like I just think at the moment with what's happening, like I made I made this comparison earlier and I like I, I, a lot of football fans might find it ridiculous in terms of in terms of the calibre. But do you remember when Jurgen Klopp was coming through when he first took over at Liverpool and there was a serious disconnect between the club and the owners and everything mm. that was happening and and he was trying to get that connection back and he, he drew a game he drew a game with West Brom and he brings the players down in front of the cup and he gets them to do like a bow and the cup kind of saluted because I think he was saying the fans stuck by them and, and there was plenty of detractors about that at the time David I remember there was lots of slagging yeah, uh, this is a draw against here. West Brom come here listen you're talking to culprit number one here I thought it was absolutely ridiculous but then you kind of get a sense and you get that feeling you see what Klopp has done since and listen it's your parallels obviously will stop there in terms of the, the quality and all the rest of it but I just think they're neat, especially with international football and touch on some of the issues that that will be facing Kenny with the players and then when you go back to clubs but they have to feel that connection the fans have to feel that connection to a team and to a, to a kind of a sense of Purpose within it, and they can listen. Or, or the fans can will have put up with a lot o- over the years, but I do think if, they, if Kenny can get that, where they actually will, they'll deal with maybe the odd hiccup here and there, so long as there is obviously progress and that has to come. And let's be honest, those results will have to come. But something like that, like we saw him literally raising Gavin Bazuna his arm to the crowd at the end of the game. He obviously realised what it meant in terms of that result, and it could just be something we look back on. Might not. But it could be something that you look back on and think that could have been the formation. Because like there's people coming out of that game last night excited by some of those players. No one's blind to the issues that are still there. No one's going to be blind to the problems when the, the manager hasn't won a competitive game yet. But the, I don't think there'd be a single fan. I genuinely don't think there would have been a single fan coming out of that game thinking that there's nothing, something could be stored and with how of that manager can get the fans buying into, buying into that team. But also... And you hear it from the players 100% behind the manager because it's something that people have been alluding that it hasn't been the case. And it's clear that it is. And I just hope as time progresses that the progress on the pitch with the results do marry up because ultimately that's what he, exactly he will be judged on. Yeah, well, Stephen Kenny, we all saw the banner um, in Kenny We Trust, which was put up on the uh, Southern Stand and the players and Kenny walked by it at the end, which created lots of photo opportunities. Well, Stephen Kenny spoke after the game, uh, particularly after his comments midweek about him getting the team ready principally for the 2024 qualifiers for the European Championships. It has called into question... Were the FAI on board with this? Was the previous FAI board who appointed Stephen Kenny, were they aware of this? What's Jonathan Hill's position? Stewie Byrne was saying to us in the commentary last evening that the FAI probably need to give a bit of clarity around the position of the team and whether it's about results now and billing for the future. This is what Stephen Kenny had to say after the game about his current relationship with the FAI. I have clear communication with with, uh, you know, key people in the FAI and they've been nothing but supportive and I think uh, it's irrelevant if someone writes something in the back of a newspaper or whatever, that, you know, and then it becomes... A, that, that's, um, you know, it's... It, I can't get... I can't get, uh, you know, so, sidelined by that. I need to need to stay, remain focused on the job in hand because um, ultimately... Um, Players, you know, people have seen over the last week. They've seen some, some, you know, in the last few windows, some really talented players coming through. Yeah, the experienced players have shown them a brilliant attitude. Listen, the poor ninety-seven minute goal in Portugal, which would have been, you know, one of the great results, is our only defeat in six matches now. And uh, but we haven't, uh, we've been drawn too many. We need to start turning the draws into wins. And um, and you know so that's um, we've got the two games next month and then we've got Portugal coming here um, and and Luxembourg so we've got as we and Qatar so they're, they're good games and um, we um, so yeah um, a lot a lot of good things from the week really but just um, you know probably. <laughs> Probably Serbia overall could have deserved to win tonight. You know they were they were they were exceptional. 
but we, 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 we dug in, showed different type of qualities and played a lot of good football as well um, and had obviously two chances at the death to win it with Andrew, Andrew's brilliant shot and Shane Duffy's header. But they were, they were very good, I felt, Serbia overall. David, just to pick up on Stephen Kenny's first kind of 20, 30 seconds of that answer from the press conference, supporters can be guilty of going through a roller coaster on an international window. So at a point during the Portugal game, it was as if everything has clicked and things are going very well for the Republic of Ireland. A couple of goals are conceded, but everyone seems quite proud of the performance in Faro. Then there's a lot of disappointment about not beating Azerbaijan on Saturday, a certain sense of pessimism, and even in some of the newspapers, claims that Stephen Kenny's job is almost on the line with the game last night. And then there's the late equaliser, and everyone is elated and goes out of the window quite pleased by the fact that Ireland were able to salvage a draw. The FAI probably have to be clear, don't they, that it's not just about game by game here and what the next result is going to be in qualifying. That if what Stephen Kenny said midweek, that this is about a long-term project, the FAI have to endorse that, don't they? Yeah, no, I think I think they do, absolutely. I am um, especially because the nature of of the whole discourse around around Stephen Kenny at the moment is it's all focused on on him. Seems to be camp of either pro or anti. It's trying to find it is trying to find that 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 middle ground. And you kind of you have to remember as, as well like the, the current FAI and the board and the people who are running the show at the FAI weren't the ones who actually appointed Stephen Kenny. Remember this. It was obviously part of the succession plan that came that was in place when, when the former CEO, uh, when the former CEO kind of uh, put this put this plan together. Obviously, there's still people in and around the FAI who have who have maintained who have maintained positions. But the te- in terms of the decision makers, it is very much a it is very much a new FAI. My understanding of the situation, and even from speaking, is is that there is more support there for Stephen Kenny than. Has been has been made clear partly because obviously, well, obviously there was those three international games being played, so they're not going to come out maybe in in the midst of all all this when the games are over. There might be something that could uh, could be coming soon. I don't I don't know, but in terms of if if you look at if you look at this window just purely from a point of view of what's happened, they haven't won a game. They've drawn they've drawn two, but if you look, look at that Portugal game and the same people who are kind of maybe criticising and rightly so what happened against Hasha Bojan because I think he got his team wrong and I think how the team set up what what wasn't quite right but in that Portugal game I think part of the reason why people were so excited by him or something that and obviously to get the goal in, even by the time he scored the goal they could have won down considering Portugal missed the penalty Portugal had chances in that game but it was seen an Ireland team actually play very smart against a team who are far superior and pose an attacking threat in terms of on either flank and exposing to extra, really Pepe and Ruben Diaz being there, you could see the two of them being how uncomfortable they were and how they had clearly earmarked how you can get at on either on either flank because the, the fullbacks for Portugal were, were pushing up and whether it was there just maybe a bit of arrogance or just maybe feeling well we're going to be okay here. Ireland did pose pose a serious threat in that game. I think that's what kind of that's what a lot of people not so much caught people by surprise but it just kind of shows you that this is someone who knows how to put a tactical plan together which as Matt Doherty was talk, discussing as well after the game last night is something that the players have been seriously impressed by and they were the ones talking about how they let themselves down against Azerbaijan in terms of what had been put out for them to do etc you know it's it's at the moment, and I'm sure fans and people listen. Like it, it does be continually maybe tiresome from the point of view of every game. So it's almost as if every game he has to prove his his credentials. But mm. I don't I don't think, I don't think it's the case. He obviously has to set games. That's just he needs results just to kind of maybe buy that time a little bit. But if he said himself rightly or wrongly, he this was obviously Stephen Kenny saying this at the start of the week that he said and it was it was a bit of a departure because he hadn't said it before and that needs to be made clear as well it wasn't something that he laid out obviously I think anyone could read between the lines and it was pretty clear from the amount of players that he was bringing through that it was clear that that's what he was doing he would have obviously hoped that not to have had an absolute nightmare of a result against Luxembourg and it looks like Vajrajan he would have maybe been hoping that they would have had enough to get through those type of games just to keep the kind of the the wolves at bay a little bit, but yeah, no, without doubt, we do feel as if at this point it, it just it was just bringing a little bit of 
of uh, of clarity and we're just quieting a little bit of the noise down on both sides because at some point it's not about just what who the manager is who the manager is it's about everything else is going with it and what's actually happening and if he's if he's given the time to to actually progress things but then I think bear, that will bear fruit eventually and if it is Euro 2024 well then well then so be it it's not as if I said this when he came in it's not as if when he has taken this blueprint of continued success and enjoyment for, for Irish football and ripped it up and decided he's are all wrong I'm doing it this way this is like everyone's been talking about issues in Irish football for years and getting to the Euros, the expanded Euros in obviously in twenty six in twenty sixteen and qualifying in twenty in twenty twelve too. That's great and it's it's it was a, a joy to be there. But when there's still so many other problems and you don't know when you're ever gonna get back there again because unless you spend big money on a big name manager, it was just, it's just all about then. Well then it is what he said. It's like well where's where's the sustainability in that? We've seen where the FAI are now. We've seen how the FAI managed to have Gio Trapattoni as the manager in the fourth place. It wasn't because of the finances the FAI were gen- uh, generating. It was because they had a wealthy backer who was able to give them money. And likewise, when when Martin O'Neill was in, was in charge and then even Mick McCarthy, who lives at the end of a campaign, I think people forget this as well, that Mick McCarthy did receive a very, very lucrative payoff to live um, at, during the campaign, obviously when COVID had disrupted the schedule. Like it's almost as if people think he was like shafted in some way, and that and that the FAI were were kind of just determined to get Kenny in, and that, and that was it. it. Wasn't the case at all. I would so, suggest as well, Mick McCarthy was more than happy to walk back and get a job in the championship. He went via Cyprus, but I think Mick McCarthy was already eyeing up his next employment anyway. Well, well, see, well yeah, well, obviously, it's hard. I don't know what Mick McCarthy's in, in, intentions were, but he he came in as a troubleshooter, effectively. Mm. Did a good, did a did a good, did a good job, but no one was there thinking this is the man to take our or, or, to take Irish football forward for the next n- number of years. And it's and I mentioned that at the start of the conversation when you look at maybe Serbia and how in the ten years that they kind of maybe formed their own kind of uh, home based academy and were really putting the structures in place to bring players through. If you look in the Ireland team we played yesterday, and it's been the same for. Hasn't well, it has been the same for years essentially, more so in recent years with the amount of more so League of Ireland graduates. But if you go through the likes of say Gavin Bizzuno, obviously would have earned his crust for Sean McRobbers and stayed here before Man City uh, took and played in the in the Premier Division. Like there's other lads in again, even in even that back far along, like in terms of say Matt Doherty, who obviously would have been with Bohemians before going to Wolves. There's like Shane Duffy, who was straight over to Everton at a young age. Again, Andrew Omar Ramadelli being at League Slip and then signing for signing for Norwich. James McLean, who would have came through with Derry and then gone to Sunderland. You go through the like, these are lads who are they're finding their different pathways to getting to the to the force team, and that's fine because I don't think you can just necessarily throw everything throw everything out and say, well, this is the one way we have to develop players, and this is the only way we have to develop players. I think you have to accept that in the in the culture of Irish football and just and how it is that you're they're gonna find different they are gonna find different pathways. But I, 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 I've never been more sure of myself that there has to be just a common thread at home here, be it through the FAI and the and the underage national teams, which is has been happening, but also obviously with the League of Ireland academies and, and how they're properly funded be it by government or the FAI if that's if that's possible. There has to be that common thread here that brings them brings them through that they know what's expected of them. You see someone like Josh Cullen who would have came through West Ham and be, and come through through the, obviously the parent drill and stuff. Like you're always gonna have these moments. That shouldn't those avenues should never be shut off the players in terms of if they qualify to play and maybe haven't always been um in that kind of environment that here in Ireland. But it needs to be a case of they know what's expected of them and they know the, the way a common way to play rather than lurching from one short term vision of a manager to another what was in interesting that was of delivering success. We were chatting John to Malters a little bit earlier on and uh, John's involved currently with the Republic of Ireland under 19s and for anyone who missed it you can uh, check it out on the uh, podcast section on otbsports.com or have a look back in our social channels for the video but he said at the 19s they're prioritising the type of players that they have so it's 
tactics dictated more by the players than by an overarching pathway. Is that something that you feel has to change, David? Well, no, well, that, well, that, like, this is what I'm saying. So in terms of a pathway, it's, if you obviously if you work with your players, boy, it'd be very interesting. You mentioned Dusan Tadic. Like, if you're working with, as a coach, listen, John Walters is a qualified coach. This is where you have to build to people who actually have the have the experience and have, and have, and have the knowledge. But I would, you would, you would imagine that if the way a team and a country want to play is comfortable in possession, tactically fluid, uh, you still want to have that heart and, and the desire that we saw last night of a team that should never be discarded for the sake of that. But you have to be able to to like it's like any country you should be able to have have it not have it all because it's very difficult <laughs> they had to have it all but you know what I mean if you need to be able to have the coaches who can who can produce those technically gifted players because they are there like it's again it is there you have to give them the environment here that they can thrive in and that day to day environment at the moment in terms of the League of Ireland academies that are now being are, are now being kind of um, pushed and backed by the FAI at the moment, there's so many such so, so good work being being done there, but they are still chasing their tail for from years and years of having League of clubs, quite frankly, having no interest in doing that. And the game, so the game is, has changed as well. Like Brexit is going to be the game changer here. Once upon a time, the development pathway was if a guy is good enough in his teenage years, he's going to end up in academy in the UK. There's going to be a pathway towards football, even if he drops down the pyramid after being at a top team. Now, because yeah. of the rules of players going across changing and also just the, the sheer landscape of the way the academies are at the moment, David, where these clubs are now going out to pick the best players in the world as opposed to players in the British Isles, it's going to become more and more difficult for a player to come through at a top club in England. So we probably have to rethink about how we develop players here. Well, absolutely. And, but this, is the, this, like, this isn't a new... Obviously, Brexit has been... And, uh, been coming down the tracks for the last number for the last five years since 2016 mm. it's only been in the last maybe year or so that actual the gravity of the situation has been known by clubs and they kind of maybe thought that there would be kind of some kind of deal struck whereby you didn't have to be 18 but that is the uh that is the case and no like this is it absolutely like it's you have to kind of find a way that i think suits the culture of a of a country like i think i think i said this before actually I think we've been on the show, been on a show with Joe and Joe Malloy and, and saying to Joe, I was like, like, I don't think it's necessarily you have to do, have a, 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 a an academy structure like what we have in England because first of all, we haven't got the full-on infrastructure of clubs to, to properly to properly do that. But also, you, if you look at how many stories there are of lads who do just get discarded because it is an industry, like let football there is an in industry. There does have to be that element we're here to produce players. It's the reason why Gavin Bazuni went to Man- Manchester City is because Sean McGrovers has been creating an environment for for young players where they can thrive, like Bohemians, like St Patrick's Athletic, like Cork City, like like Derry City, obviously as well as like Rovers. Like these clubs now are are trying to are trying to get ahead of it, but like you see what happens in in other countries, and I don't think it's necessarily a case of right. Get a lad in from the age of 11, 12 and just let them solely focus on on football. Like this is it. At the moving to a much broader discussion on that, which would take up so much more, so much more time. But I just find find that if, if Stephen Kenny and the FA are discussing, well, how do we do this? How do we actually change the system? It's it's finding a way of creating it, creating an environment that suits the culture for Irish people because we've been so used to one thing for so long. It's going to be very difficult to just change everything changed everything overnight so that's the challenge as much as that now that is the challenge is is creating that environment where people can say well okay staying in Ireland isn't going to be detrimental to uh, to the elite players progress at the moment as sad as it is to say it, it, it will be and that's just how we are at the moment it's not because of a lack of trying it's not because of a lack of a, of, a, of a willingness to do it it's just because Irish football is, is trying to catch up with where other countries have been for so long. If I can bring the conversation back around to the goalkeepers uh, to finish off on, Dave, we talked about Gavin Bazuna a bit earlier. Cuevin Kelleher is the man who is currently waiting in the wings with an injury to Alisson. We've got live coverage here and off the ball of Leeds against Liverpool this coming Sunday. It looks like Cuevin Kelleher might get to play in goal for his club. He is currently relying to get first team football. And like I thought Kelleher was really good in the friendly against Qatar back in the spring. He was injured at the wrong time for the Serbia game and Bazunu got a leg up on him. 
But these mm. are probably the only times he's going to get to play first team football for Liverpool is if Alisson is injured over the next while. Alisson's just signed a long term contract. Liverpool see him as the number two. How much of a concern is it that Kelleher is probably going to have to wait quite a while to get game time at Liverpool and be a bit lucky like it looks like it's going to be the case for this weekend? It's a concern for him at the moment. It's not a concern for Lauren or Stephen Kenny because Gavin Bazuni was the number one goalkeeper and he's playing football every week. So that's the harsh reality of it. Like it is a concern for, for Keller. He made it, obviously, I think at the start, the start of last season as well where he picked up an injury too where I think he was, there was talk of him going, possibly going alone to uh, to to Holland actually and that, that kind of fell through because he picked up he picked up an injury it's um, it's it's one of the positions that Ireland like we have you'd be hoping for years to come you're going to have two of those goalkeepers who could be in an ideal world considering the clubs that they're their rack could be the number ones for Manchester City and Liverpool respectively at the moment they're a fair bit off that when you look at the, the other players who are there it's the bigger issue I think is the other players who we've been discussing who've had successful kind of windows um, and where they're at in terms of um, and playing because it again ties into just an issue for all international managers is that unless you have players who are playing regularly it's going to be very difficult to sustain momentum and build momentum when international windows come around and you're relying on lads who are, are only getting minutes here and there like obviously on the goalkeeping situation it's bizarre when you think about it that we could have a goalkeeper playing for Liverpool in the Premier League who is the number two to a goalkeeper who'll be playing for Portsmouth mm. but that's just he's how playing for Portsmouth though yeah Crucially. exactly no exactly crucially 100% and he's playing for Portsmouth and people say well, well was it League One but like let's be honest he's he's, a, he's in League One because of the age he's at like Man City don't send like him out on loan at the age of 18 before that, obviously, as well, to uh, to Rochdale and then keep him out on loan if they don't feel, you know, what he needs for team environment. I think they realised very quickly that he was thriving in the environment of, at Manchester City but needed, needed to be playing f- first team games. Um, it's the bigger issues you'd have is would be, if you look at even, like, say, let's say, feel a couple of players who, ha- who would have stood out over the course of this window would have been, obviously, making his full debut last night, Andrew Omobamadele, um, at the back end of last year brilliant with Norwich kind of got into the team kind of just past the halfway point of the season maybe about just over a quarter of the season to go and just kept his place was tremendous they won the league and was doing well in pre-season he picked up a knock missed the first game of the season Norwich then obviously go out and buy another another defender he is now trying to get into that team again now that's the challenge he has to do it if he's good enough and gets in the Premier League is rootless that if he's performing better than someone else he will get in that's just the nature of of the of the Premier League and of, of football again Adam Mead, same situation yeah. only kept, made a couple of sub appearances and these are the lads who are looking at thinking they, geez, they were so good they were so impressive but they're still obviously young and they're coming through but they're not even playing regularly for their clubs yeah. and it's, it's it's the same with Jeff Hendrick it's, it's it, we're kind of almost going you're kind of been going on a cycle because it's a conversation we've been having for the last the last number of years and that's hopefully that's something that will be out of Stephen Stephen Kenny's control and Orland's control and if when he come into it and they're the players he trusts that's going to be another challenge from his manager is to be able to to get those players and he did it for he did it in spells for, for this window, particularly in that for, in that first game, and then in the latter stages of the of last night, where he was able to do that, and that's going to just you would imagine be another constant challenge for him. Yeah, very little game time probably for some of the players. Even Matt Doherty, who played very well in this window, might not yeah. play much for Spurs uh, between now and next month. Well, coming up, we've got a change of pace. We're taking a break from the Ireland chat and asking, can Chelsea win the Premier League this season? We'll be hearing from Chelsea legends Roberto Di Matteo and Karen Carney next. <laughs> 